Okay, so normally once we start, we'll give it a second for people to jump in here. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> it's always a bit of a, you know, kind of a, an almost an awkward beginning to these things because we're waiting, once we put the, the webinar live, we're waiting for a few folks to join. So I will give it another, you know, almost a little, a little under a minute before we actually begin. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, tuning in to this, and thank you to Dr. Wells for being, being with us here um, this morning. This is another installment of the Ability Center, um, the Ability Center's webinar series, and we are, um, we are in this webinar series that we put together in an effort to better connect um, valuable and vital resources to all of our consumers in a very um, turbulent, changing time. Um, and so we launched this webinar series to talk about uh, what information is, is critical in a moment like this. And we've had a series of really wonderful conversations. And in the month of June, uh, we decided to shift our focus completely to health and well-being. And so in our first week in June, uh, our first webinar in June, we spoke with our friends at the Metro Parks of Toledo and had a really great conversation about all of the various um, opportunities and opportunities to get outside. Their tagline is get outside yourself. And they have worked really hard to make sure that all of those opportunities are also accessible to anyone with any sort of disability at any time. And then last week, we had a really great conversation about this notion of self-care and how we can be intentional about tending to ourselves and caring for ourselves in this moment uh, that, we, that we find ourselves. Today's topic I'll get to in a second, but quickly I want to plug um, next week's conversation with Al Condalucci. And Al is a longtime friend of, of the center, and you won't have to deal with me next week as our executive director, Tim Harrington, will be uh, having a conversation with Al about, about social isolation and just really, really important conversations uh, that impact the, the disability community uh, and have for some time. So before we get into today's topic, a couple housekeeping notes. Um, there is... Uh, closed captioning available at the bottom of our Zoom call. If you if you are looking for that option, um, there, it, it's available. In addition to our, uh, who's becoming our best friend, our, our friend in the interpreter here with us today. Um, if you have any questions, there are a couple ways that you can do that in the Zoom call. One is uh, in the chat and there's also a Q&A um, a Q&A button there that you can put a question in. Either one, I'll be monitoring those as we go. And also, uh, you might be watching this on Facebook. It's streaming live on, on our Facebook page. And so if you have any questions there, <coughs> excuse me, if you have any questions there, you can leave a question in the comments and th that will get relayed to me and I'll make sure to introduce it into this conversation. So today's topic is an important one, and um, it's one that, quite frankly, we've been wanting to talk about for some time. 
and it is the, the concept of telehealth. As you think about the way that healthcare is changing um, and the, the prevalence of our mobile devices that we all, that we all have um, and the connectivity that uh, the connected age of the internet brings, um, telehealth is a really, really important topic. It's also important to the mission of the Ability Center. When you think about the fact that the Ability Center's mission is to advocate, educate, and partner to provide services that support people with disabilities to thrive within their community. Uh, to me and to us at the Ability Center, uh, telehealth really really is, is, is right in the bullseye of what that looks like. So we wanna have a conversation today to um, introduce some folks potentially to the concept of telehealth and talk about its benefits and, and what it represents in our healthcare um, industry in our present moment. So with that in mind, I want to introduce you to our, to our guest, our, our expert, as we're going to force him to be recognized, uh, whether he's comfortable with that or not. Our expert here is Dr. Joe Wells. And uh, Dr. Wells is a licensed and registered occupational therapist and the chief, the chief executive of officer of the SAI group. His practice interests include community health, lifestyle medicine, and holistic health. And uh, we're so glad to have you here. So welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sam. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, get connected with you and the audience through this platform. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for being here. Introduce yourself to us. Tell us about your work and tell us how you maybe ended up on a Zoom call with me today talking about um, telehealth. Sure. Uh, so as you know, my name is Joe Wells and I've been an occupational therapist for over 25 years now. So it's been a long time. And uh, my practice right now relates to home health and assisted living. I, my, my group of companies owns uh, uh, seven home health agencies and five assisted living facilities, all in the state of Ohio, among other business interests. And uh, we've been using telehealth as an adjunct, uh, uh, as something for an outreach uh, with our patients for, since 2005. So we have had some experience with telehealth over the last you know, few years. And uh, I've been presenting on telehealth, especially to the occupational therapy community, um, because I'm a big advocate for it since it's, you know, since it was coming in new to the industry. Um, so this opportunity came by uh, Sarah Kelvin, uh, Sarah Ray. Um, she is an occupational therapy practitioner. I've known her uh, for some time and she asked me if I would be interested. I said, absolutely. I know the good work the Ability Center has been doing. Uh, in fact, I had the opportunity to be on the Defiance Board some almost 20 years ago, actually. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I'm very aware of what you're doing and keep up the great work. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big need out there. That's wonderful. It is, um, it shouldn't be surprising that we have, we have friends kind of all over the place and from several, you know, many years ago. I mean, as we sit here in 2020 celebrating our centennial year as an organization, um, the Ability Center has certainly kind of ebbed and flowed relative to the needs of, of our consumers, whoever they may be and wherever they may live. Um, so that's a cool connection that I, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually too sure about. So tell me something, um, in your experience over the course of your career, how has the delivery of healthcare changed and evolved the way that we engage with um, healthcare, which I, I want to acknowledge healthcare is even a bit of a, maybe too broad of, of a label, uh, sure. but how have you seen that evolution play out over the course of your career? Uh, sure. So one thing for certain, I'm sure we all appreciate now, especially in the past uh, four or five months, we know that change is constant and we're feeling the change all the more. Um, 
So healthcare is no different. In fact, people in healthcare would say that the change has been in hyper pace over the last few years, especially. Uh, and I would say even in the last 20 years, I think technology is the biggest driver for change. Uh, but in the healthcare industry, as I said, I've been a therapist for the past 25 years. Uh, almost all of it has been uh, my practicing years in the US, except for the six months right after graduation that I practiced in India. I, I was, uh, you know, I migrated uh, in 95. And I can tell you that there's been sweeping changes in healthcare. And healthcare is heavily regulated, as, as you know, and you understand, understandably so. Um, so if I have to summarize, I would say most, most of 90s and early 2000s, um, the emphasis one was on patient rights, safety, and quality of care. Uh, for example, the Omnibus uh, Budget Reconciliation Act of 1985 had sweeping changes in nursing home, mainly emphasizing patient safety and quality of care in nursing homes. And most of this work was in the 90s uh, uh, in terms of regulatory and policy changes. Then the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 uh, emphasized on accessibility, equitable accessibility and disability rights. So that made a lot of changes in terms of uh, how healthcare was being delivered uh, as well. Um, early 90s, the evidence-based medicine movement uh, was pretty strong. Basically, that's when we looked at, okay, we cannot go with cookie cutter methods. We cannot go with healthcare the way it's being done. We need more informed care, both in terms of informed patients and informed providers. Uh, then the HIPAA thing, which we all know now, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of, uh, I think it was 1996. And this was about protecting again, the patient's confidentiality and patient's uh, right to know. So th these were all major changes, I would say in the 90s, uh, you know, and early 2000s. Then the late 90s and the first decade of 2000, you know, 2000, basically I think it was more about information sharing. Uh, it was an explosion of information out there with the internet and everything. And I think telehealth was basically uh, intuitive to this change. Uh, so telehealth, as you know, is the use of technology to improve access to healthcare. So it's, it's sharing healthcare information remotely. Uh, that also was trending by high tech, another piece of legislation which was actually under the American Recovery and Reinvestment uh, Act of 2009. And basically now you would see that the EMR and EHR uh, is becoming more common uh, before that, like in 2008, uh, probably we had 10% of healthcare uh, practices using electronic medical records. Now it's 90 or more. Mm. And, and, and so it's all about how do you harness technology and how can you have a more connected world uh, through technology, even in healthcare. Reimbursement changes has been several, as you, uh, you know. So that is one thing that we we can be assured of that you know the way people uh, the, the the way providers get paid is going to change with evolving times, uh, and and that's what's happened in health you know over the past few years. So in summary, I would say you know. Healthcare went from being institution-centric to more community-based uh, because more and more people were, ex were uh, expecting and should be getting healthcare in the community-based settings. It went from a volume-based to a value-based uh, reimbursement system. 
So instead of you know getting reimbursed based on just how much services uh, you are, you are rendering, it also took into account of the patient's uh, outcomes. So in a sense, it was pay for performance, although it's it's not uh, broadly used yet. But I think you we are going to see more pay for performance systems out there. Uh, for example, hospitals are paid better if if there's less free admissions. Uh, nursing homes and home health were earlier paid based on volume of services, but now the patient's condition is taken into account as well. So the other thing I would say is like patient experience is a big consideration now. Uh, that includes convenience and access to services. And telehealth fits right in there because we're talking about patient uh, convenience. Uh, so, so basically internet and the information explosion in general have caused a more rare client and therefore it is important to have more options and choices. Uh, so my reading into the past 20, 25 years is, is that we have a more connected world and people have more options. And, and I, I Go no, I was just going to say, I love that you you draw this line showing a, a, a pattern toward it being more about the consumer, mm -hmm. it being more about the, the, the patient, it being more about it being more about the person receiving the care rather than the system delivering it. And it strikes me that that telehealth is, as you said, just a, a, a natural um, intuitive next step to take with that. Um, you know, we're going to get into the, I hope, hope that we get into the nitty gritty of what telehealth looks like and how people can access it and use it and what it is best used for and what it may not be best used for. But one more kind of contextual question for you. Um, how have, you know, like you said, in the last 10 weeks, you know, four months ish, how, how have you seen the COVID-19 um, season that we're in change our relationship to telehealth? Sure. So, so COVID-19 actually, uh, in some respects, I would say, uh, hastened the process and, and uh, uh, forced us to recognize how telehealth could be beneficial. Uh, so before COVID-19, uh, there was very little reimbursement available for these services, for telehealth services. So there, there were a few exceptions, very limited reimbursements available for uh, rural health settings and uh, certain practices, but it was not wide sweeping. Uh, very few insurance companies were was covering it. But I think that the, the pandemic brought into forefront that, you know, there's a safety concern that people going to access these services, first of all, in, in institutions, that's difficult. The other thing is uh, it's both the safety for the provider uh, and, and the client themselves. Uh, those flaws, or I would say those dangers came to the forefront. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I think the world is interconnected with the pandemic, of course, this, this condition is spread throughout the world. It makes, makes sense to know what's going on throughout the world, what's, what's working, what's not working. And all of that can be done through telehealth. So let's say there was an expert in, some, in another country. We could harness that expertise with patients in another country you know, that might not have that specialization uh, per se. So I, I think all of this kind of hastened the process to recognize that it is more about global sharing of health information. Uh, it's about the need for healthcare delivery in every setting. So, you know, 
uh, because obviously it's not just that patients are going to go to the hospitals or to the nursing homes to get the services. People still need the services in whatever setting they are in like assisted living, independent living, their own homes, sheltered homes or whatever it may be. Uh, so I, so the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services recognized that. Uh, and in March, they came out with the waiver. I think it's called the waiver 1135. And they recognized that we need to reimburse for telehealth services. Uh, and, and they started reimbursing more people. And now, although this is a, this change is just for emergency and on a temporary basis based on this waiver, uh, but it's going to stay for some time, it seems like. And at least it opens up the avenue. It's, it's also testing that how effective are the telehealth services. And, you know, when they see the outcomes, I believe that telehealth is going to be continuing as, as a reimbursed service. Uh, certain changes that you would see was also about I think there was a barrier that the telehealth equipment and stuff like that had to be, uh, had to ensure that it was in compliance with HIPAA and high tech requirements. And, and, and those uh, have kind of been waived to, to a certain degree. Uh, so in a sense, uh, uh, the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services have, have relaxed uh, the regulations surrounding the use of telehealth and, and, and more and more providers are using it and it's, it's an effective tool. It's, it's, it's a tool to reach to the masses and, 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 that's, and it's a safe tool. You know? So I, I think telehealth is, is, is going to take on, take off now. Um, people are going to see the benefit of it and more and more people are going to use it. Yeah. So let's get into that a little bit. Tell us, tell us about what, what telehealth is, what, when we talk about telehealth, what are we actually talking about? What people should know, what might be some common misconceptions? Um, sure. Yeah, give us a bit of an overview yeah. on what it actually is. Uh, I'll try and share my screen a little bit and go over a few slides just to, uh, you know, understand the topic a little better. Are, are you able to see my screen right now? Not yet. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right, so some just related terms, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, they are used interchangeably. Uh, but telemedicine is basically use, use of technology uh, for clinical services and to share health information remotely. Um, so it's, it's basically a clinical service like dermatology or uh, psychology, uh, occupational therapy. So there's a clinical component to it. Uh, but telehealth is, is a more encompassing word. It's, it's a broader term which may or may not include clinical services. For example, you could be doing a fitness or well-being class, and that could be considered a telehealth uh, session as well. The other related terms is e-health or electronic health. It's the use of internet to deliver healthcare or to get healthcare information. M-health, you've heard that word too. M-health is mobile health, so using your mobile devices. Uh, like an iPad or, uh, or a tablet or, or your uh, smartphone to exchange health information. Um, the other words you would uh, probably hear is telemonitoring or remote patient monitoring. Um, basically, this is monitoring the patient's health conditions uh, remotely. So it could be vital signs like blood pressure, high rate, whatever, you know, you're looking at uh, healthcare markers, uh, blood, um, oxygen saturation levels, blood glucose levels. So that would be also considered. It's basically telehealth, but 
people also use the word telemonitoring or remote patient monitoring. So that's basically using technology in healthcare and accessing healthcare information remotely. That in a sense would be the definition for telehealth. So telemedicine or telehealth, uh, telehealth includes uh, synchronous video conferencing. So let's say we were to do a, a health session right now. So this webinar could qualify uh, as a telehealth session if we were to share uh, health information. It could be done in an asynchronous manner. So you could take images, now upload it to your computer or your cell phone, and you're sending it to your provider. The provider gets back to you with a diagnosis or treatment. So that's done on a, you know, you're basically storing it and then forwarding that information and you're getting information in return. It's not happening in real time, but that too is included in telehealth. It could be web-based information. So there's information through a portal. Uh, you are, you're trying to access that. Uh, e-health patient portals, so some insurance companies or some providers, uh, they have like uh, portals that people, uh, the patients could log into and get their health information. We went over remote uh, monitoring in our last slide, so it's for and mostly done for vital signs. So if you're doing monitoring for that, that's included in telehealth. Uh, more and more medical education is also being uh, rendered to the internet and, and that, that could qualify as telehealth. People are getting trained or even for second opinions or specialist opinions. So you could have a provider that does, you know, would like to consult with, with an expert in another location. They could do it through telehealth. Then there are nursing call centers. People can call into those uh, call centers and get health information. So that's another way to access telehealth. I showed this picture out here. This is like a computer device used for video conferencing. I, I'll call it a telehealth hub. You could attach through USB ports or through Bluetooth. You could you could attach peripherals like a glucometer, a vein scale, a thermometer, depending upon what, what health parameter you would like to monitor. You could attach that or even just do a video conference. Uh, and that, uh, you know, could constitute a, a telehealth session. Uh, just the telehealth process in general. So you have a patient or a client you have a healthcare provider, and if they were to meet face-to-face, -face, that's an in-person visit, but if they were using technology uh, to get that healthcare, you know, usually through, it goes through a server, or it could be uh, completely web-based, and, 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 and that constitutes the telehealth process as such. That information can be available to family members, or to a researcher as well. So let's say there were a group of patients getting telehealth services uh, on diabetes. The researcher wants to study the use of a drug. They could pull this data as well. So uh, the telehealth equipment could be anything. It could be any smart smartphone, tablets, laptops, or desktops. So we'll call it the computer device. It could be a computer-based device just meant for telehealth, like the hub I showed you before. And if you have a video camera, you could just use that as, as a telehealth equipment. There's several peripheral testing devices available in the market that uh, basically connects to a computer device or they could have an inbuilt computer, uh, like a vein scale, a thermometer, pulse oximeter, blood pressure device, glucometer, uh, even AKG, a spirometer, which is for lung functions, a PT INR monitor, which is basically for blood clotting, uh, time to uh, monitor that. Uh, 
usually those are equipment, uh, those are pieces of equipment that you could use at a home or a community-based setting. Then if uh, the physician's offices and stuff, you could also use stethoscopes, otoscopes, which is for the ears, microscope for lab, uh, EKGs, ultrasounds, basically any device out there. So this is for, let's say, for physical checkups and stuff, or for lab work that could be used. And somebody, let's say an expert is uh, uh, at another location, they could access the information and they could do a teleconsultation for, for that. An example would be a patient goes in, gets an X-ray done, there's no radiologist available, but that X-ray is being read by an expert in, in that area, maybe in England, and they come back with the diagnosis uh, based on the, the uh, X-ray that was actually taken in Ohio. So Can I ask you a quick question here too? Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned something that I, I just want to, that I think is really interesting, maybe a couple slides ago about sure. the, that this information can be uh, uh, viewed or accessed by the family and by researchers. Um, nice. There are still, even outside of the, um, even outside of the, the current CMS, uh, maybe, um, you know, relaxed restrictions. There are still HIPAA implications of that information, correct? That is correct. So the patient has to consent to that. So they could say, um, and, and HIPAA doesn't go away. You know, it, it's basically those requirements are still there. But for example, uh, earlier, the devices or the programs you were using, the platforms you were using, to convey that information had to be pre-certified for HIPAA. So encryption was a big issue, but now you could practically use your phone uh, for a telehealth consultation with your doctor or your therapist or any healthcare provider as such. And those requirements have gone away, but you still have to establish a provider patient uh, relationship. You still have to have the patient consent to privacy uh, you know, features. Uh, you cannot share that information with any and everybody. So those provisions are still there and the patient has to sign off and agree to those. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so here are more pictures on, you know, some of the peripherals, I call them peripherals because these are devices that attach to a computer or connect to a computer. So wearable technology, we all know, you know, the iWatch and stuff like that, you could use that, or the Fitbit. That information can go into uh, a program and that program could relay information to, as we said, you know, your provider or whoever you want to share that information uh, with. So just pictures of different peripherals based on what you want to monitor. This bottom picture right here, if you can see my, my mouse going over, this is like a telehealth station. So you have the computer and everything. You could take it to the patient, let's say they're in a, in a nursing home or a hospital. You could just take it there to the patient and do an actual uh, video conference with an expert sitting somewhere else. Over here, you see uh, ultrasound pro. So it's connected to a computer, you could do the ultrasound and somebody else is looking at the ultrasound somewhere else. This is a simple uh, home telehealth device. So you have a hub, a computer hub. So pe people could use this. This is actually USB uh, ported pulse oximeter and a blood pressure cuff, but you, know, you could have uh, vi wireless devices and Bluetooth connected devices as well. So this is a session where you see the, a person is sitting at home using a blood pressure cuff and talking to the provider. So actually telehealth session in place. Over here, one of the providers is doing a health procedure and probably an expert is looking at it and providing real time uh, telehealth conference, uh, telehealth uh, consultation. 
a, a, a physical or occupational therapist uh, evaluating or exercising with the hand uh, again in real time at this stage. Um, I had a YouTube session, you know, you could go in there and you could see several examples of telehealth uh, consultations. So, and, and, and we can, and we can make this available on our website on the webinar page. Yeah. So that everyone watching, they can go and access your slides. If you send those over, we'll make those available. Sure. That sounds good. So, so for example, I'm just going to play this a little bit. Um, this is, so it's an online uh, occupational therapy session. So one second, I think I think that you need to share that window so we can see that video. Oh, you could so see it. Okay. What animal do you we see? can hear it, but we can't see the video yet. Got you. Got you. Let's do our crab walks. Ready? Let's do ten crab walks. Belly up. Okay, I'm not sure how to do that. Let me see you. I am sharing my screen, but I think I have to share. Well, if it's okay, we can always make that video available All right. after the session as well. Sure. Sounds good. So, so in a sense, you know, telehealth applications could be used for human resource purposes. So there's a shortage or non-availability of certain disciplines, for example. Uh, you could use it to uh, you know, fulfill that need. So let's say your, your town doesn't have a neuro radiologist, and now you want to consult with a neuro radiologist from another town, and of course traveling is not an option or it's, or it's cumbersome, you could have a telehealth session for that. Training and research, we did touch base on that. You could use telehealth uh, features for that. It makes financial sense as well, uh, based on um, you know, how you use it. For example, we, we need to also consider the, the financial burden of, on clients trying to access healthcare. And if they had this op opportunity, probably overall cost savings can be realized. And of course, in clinical practice, it's, it's, it's widely used. So I believe that's one other slide I had, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so telehealth is everything, but you cannot fix everything virtually. So your x-ray shows a broken rib, but we, we fixed it with Photoshop. That's not telehealth for sure. <laughs> if only. If only, exactly. If only. Well, I appreciate that overview. Let's talk about how um, and this would be a great time if anyone has questions. I'm looking at the chat here. Uh, I, I should say the, the attendees. Uh, if there's staff from the Ability Center that want to ask questions, um, I would appreciate that. I always like to hear what, what other, other staff members um, are thinking as they listen to this information. Um, so if you do have any questions, make sure to put those in and I'll, um, I'll make sure to read those. Let's talk about the implications of this technology and this evolution in healthcare for people with disabilities. Um, if I can kind of start the conversation, it strikes me that there's, there's two kind of directions that you were laying out in, in your presentation. One is um, all of the efficiencies, you can see it, in what the technology provides, all of the efficiencies for the healthcare provider. I mean, you're talking about connecting to someone in England to look at a, an x-ray. You're talking, I mean, so you're talking about the really amazing scale and efficiency that this provides the healthcare mm -hmm. provider. Um, and then at the same time, there could be some implications to using that in an in-person setting if say a say a patient isn't interested in that i mean what if how how do let's talk about this for a quick second 
how does the healthcare system balance patient preference with mm-hmm. provider efficiency? Sure. So, so patient, perform, uh, patient preference is paramount, all right? The patient has to consent to using telehealth. That's, that's number one. Um, in, in, and, and then there, there are licensing laws, which has been, uh, they waived that out right now. Earlier it was that the provider had to be licensed in the state uh, where they're providing the services. Uh, so basically the patient is from Ohio, the provider had to be licensed in Ohio. For, for COVID-19, that has been waived. It will be waived as long as that waiver 1135 uh, is in place. And it could be extended. We don't know that yet. Uh, but I think to answer your question, the patient, patient preference is number one. Uh, so if the patient doesn't choose to have telehealth, they don't have to. The question now comes to, I, I, I think it's made so easy that I feel more and more patients would want to do it. Earlier, they wanted to talk to the physicians or the nurse, the nurse back practitioners and stuff. But I think there was a pushback even from the doctor's office because you know they didn't want to uh, talk to them over the phone and stuff. But that's been made easier since they are now reimbursing even for a phone call. There are certain mm-hmm. restrictions to that, but now a phone call uh, to a provider or from a provider is reimbursable under uh, the waiver. And I, I think more and more people are open to it. So yeah. I think patients don't realize, but they're actually getting a sort of a telehealth uh, consultation when they're calling the physician's office offices now. Yeah. No, I think that that's a, that's a great point. And I think also it'll be interesting to see how our comfort level as a society just just really shoots through the roof when you consider how we've been doing this now for any type of interaction. We've almost been forced into a web-based um, type conversation. So that'll be that'll be interesting. So let's let's talk about this other lane over here. A quick question for you: What do you think? What are some of the implications or opportunities specifically for people with disabilities when it comes to telehealth? What are some of the exciting things that you see and ways that we can use telehealth to better meet the healthcare needs of people with disabilities? Sure. Before I forget one thing though, uh, so telehealth you could use like, uh, I'll I'll come back to your question, but I I don't want to miss this point. So you could use like programs like FaceTime and Skype uh, for telehealth sessions, but you could, you know, you should not be using like the face, uh, Facebook Live or Twitter, uh, I think it's called TikTok and Twitch. Those programs are public facing programs and, and there are special directives by insurance companies and Medicare that providers should not be using it or patients should not be using it. More so because it's, it's public facing, so it's, it's a confidentiality issue. If people did start doing that though, we would have many more funny comic strips to show at the end of your presentation. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That could, get, that could get out of hand quickly if people started um, using TikTok for telehealth services. So I'm glad you brought that point up though. It's good. Well, it could be a meme. We, we could have, <laughs> it, it would be funny. Uh, but getting, getting back to your question, I, I think this is a great opportunity. As we know that accessibility is still, the ADA came out in 1990. Um, we had the American Rehabilitation Act, which was in, I think, 75. But Despite everything, there's, there's been many advances in that, but I think access, accessibility is still a big question and especially for persons with disabilities. So how many times have we heard clients saying, oh, that provider's office 
was not accessible enough for me. I have difficulty going into that office and stuff like that, or I'm not, I'm not able to uh, get my appointments in time because the provider is overworked or this time doesn't suit me or I'm not on the bus route. There could be many questions, um, many issues with accessibility. I think telehealth is, is a great solution for them. So if, if, it, if, it's, if they need the services where they don't need a in-person procedure, you know, telehealth would be a great solution for that. But in case if they need an inpatient procedure, of course, you know, they would have to uh, go to an institution setting or an office setting for that. Sure. A couple of questions we're getting through the through the Q and A, sure. and then also one from Facebook. Let's start with Facebook. Um, so someone's asking, how does the the client actually get the tools so the info can be transferred to the doctor? And here's the example they used. My son receives home care, which is on hold with COVID-19 for now. His nurse does, does a call weekly and asks how he's doing, but nothing is actually monitored. So how does the client actually get the tools so the info can be transferred to the doctor? Sure. So, so some of the thing is you could just use, let's say for the peripherals, let's say you wanted to check vital signs, like the blood pressure and stuff. There's, there's two ways to do it. There could be a system, uh, like an automated phone call goes out there to the patients and they, they could be using any regular uh, device like a, a wing scale or a blood pressure cuff and they keep records of uh, that data and they get a phone call. It's like the automated phone calls, you punch in your, in your numbers, it, it goes, it, it basically tells you to go through uh, the questions and input your information uh, using numbers and stuff. You could do that. And that information automatically goes to a program which you know, lays out the information for the provider. And the provider goes into that program and he can look at it. So that's, that's one system, which is like a low tech system. Many home health agencies already provide uh, integrated telehealth systems. Uh, you know, so basically they'll have to check with that home health company to see if they have those devices. Unfortunately, Medicare or Medicaid does not cover uh, remote patient monitoring yet. Um, and, and so there's no reimbursement for that, but there could be uh, some certain private insurance or certain private uh, insurance programs uh, that reimburses for that. So that they would have to check uh, with the home health agency if that's a covered service. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But those, so uh, but the, that equipment, because the patient is at home, they need to check with the home health company and, and talk about the options they can offer. Right, right. Okay. Thank you for that. So um, this is in the Q&A on our, our Zoom call here, and it's uh, from our friend Sarah. Um, so she says, you know, as you think about the way that telehealth eliminates barriers, the need for transportation as a barrier, for example, uh, what experience do you have with using telehealth in conjunction with other assistive technology to increase access? ASL interpreter, the uh, video, a screen reader. So how do you think about the way these, these tools integrate and work together to increase access um, even more? Sure, I, I think uh, that's a great question, Sarah. Uh, in fact, there are programs, there, there are platforms uh, that integrates that. So basically you have an AC, uh, is um, uh, interpreter or even language interpreters uh, that stand by. So for example, you're doing a video conferencing with a patient, uh, you know, where language is a barrier. You have a language interpreter, uh, you know, 
dial-in as well at the same time, and they would interpret that in real time with you. you know? So that's been done too. I personally haven't done that yet, but I know of people who have used that. And in fact, well, programs that do that. Can I interrupt you and say, you have done it because you're doing it right now. That's correct. I am doing I love, it. Yeah, exactly. I, just, I love that you brought up that example because that's one of the things that we have experienced in trying to use this Zoom platform for webinars to reach wider audiences, communicate important information. We, we had to make sure that we had the pieces in play to hit on that exact point. So what I hear you saying is that similar to this setup, there are some of those um, capabilities and opportunities in a healthcare setting. Absolutely. And, and, and just to uh, uh, bring up another point, in fact, JCO accredited facilities have a requirement that they have to look at, you know, providing access to people uh, where English, the English language is a barrier. Um, so that's, that's kind of a institutional policy requirement by many institutions that are uh, accredited by JCO. And it's also an, an area where health systems often trip up. Um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, I would not say it's a, a shining star in our American healthcare system that we often have the, the types of resources available relative to interpreters, um, you know, of, of any language, and some of those accessibility options. However, it strikes me similar to your example of someone reading an x-ray in, you know, in England, um, does that provide opportunities, right, to increase the volume and scale of of some of those interpreters and services. So that's really, really interesting. Um, I don't see any other questions. So as we finish up, what are some what are some key takeaways or some things that you would want our audience to be thinking about? Sure, sure. I think telehealth, one of the barriers I, and, and you know, based on my practice, what I, I've heard is that, you know, people are afraid of technology and, and telehealth doesn't mean huge equipment or a big learning curve. You could use simple processes as well, as simple as using a smartphone. So there are lots of options out there uh, to use that. Again, telehealth is not a clinical specialty. It's, it's a tool to use in delivering healthcare better. You know? So it's, it's not that the provider has to have special training or that's a specialty by itself. So it could be a dermatologist, you know, a cardiologist or whatever, and they're using telehealth to, to basically provide the services. Uh, yeah. th those are main things. I, I think overall, more and more people would use it. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an easy and cost-effective way to access healthcare, especially non-emergent non -emergent healthcare. There are many uh, procedures where you don't need an in, uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, encounter with your provider. Telehealth would be a great uh, um, a tool for that, especially in, in, in this pandemic era. I think safety is a big concern and this is a very safe tool. Think about you know, uh, going to a setting and the chances of catching an infection because of that. So all those can be mitigated. It's also for provider safety. You know, uh, if they get exposed inadvertently to, uh, to this. So there's, there's a, the, you know, I think COVID-19 basically recognized all these and they recognize the merits of telehealth. And, and that's the reason I, I think people are talking more about it. I think there'll be a greater acceptance to it. I hope and I believe uh, telehealth is there to stay. There'll be more uh, policies built into it to make it more safer to use. Uh, I see the future uh, you know, of telehealth pretty secure. Uh, technology is there to stay. It's only there to you know, make us better. 
off of that, that that was it. I thought of a question I want to ask to really finish. I, I promise this will be my last one. Um, <clears throat> to go, you know, you started by talking about, you know, 25 years ago. Let's end by talking about 25 years from now. So I, I sometimes frame up these curiosities of mine relative to my children and how old they are. And my youngest, um, my youngest who uses a wheelchair, she is four years old. So 25 years from now, right before she turns 30, uh, what do you, th I mean, where, where is this all headed? What are some of the things that you could see um, and, and how might we be using um, this technology that wasn't around 25 years ago? Mm -hmm. And over the course of human history, 50 years is a short time. So 25 years from now, where, where will this be? And again, of course, you know, uh, no one's seen the future, but you're exactly correct. Technology is, is exploding uh, in a, you know, rapid rate. I, I see more and more patients taking care of the healthcare themselves. I see a lot of automation in healthcare. A robotic surgery is there, but probably there's more automation to it. Right now, probably we need people to come in and you know, handle some of the devices. It's possible that that's going to be more robotic. Think about you know, more automated. Think about your, your you know, I'm, I'm talking about say 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted an eyeglass, you had those, uh, you know, somebody manually checking uh, to see uh, your visual acuity, acuity, how it, it is and stuff like that. But now the computer as well does that. You know, I, I think more and more that's gonna be automated. Uh, our, de our dependence on healthcare providers, we would always need healthcare providers, don't get me wrong, but, but the health disciplines themselves would evolve with technology. Uh, I, I, I think there would be less in person, more automation, in person visits would be for, you know, more skilled procedures that need to be done. Uh, including, you know, like telepsychiatry, actually telepsychiatry, telepsychology are the forerunners. And you would think, you know, those disciplines, because it needs uh, in person or, or, you know, interaction would be, you know, in the back burners, but that's not the case. Those disciplines are actually the forerunners in telehealth. People were doing that, and especially in the VA system, maybe 20, 25 years ago, you know, and, and, and most of the studies or most of the um, information on telehealth uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, the benefits of telehealth have, 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 have been studied in those disciplines. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I myself have actually used that. I know other people that have as well. It's 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 super interesting. So I don't have any more questions, but we do have one more from the Facebook sure. uh, feed. So we'll we'll finish up with this. And it's a good question. It's it's um, you know, it's it's interesting. So the same person who asked the previous question about um, how do you get the tools and the equipment said, "What can you do if your doctor won't do it any other way than going into the office?" Okay. Yeah, that's... Let's end on an easy one, Dr. Yeah, Let's end yeah. on an easy one. Unfortunately, so there's, there's, there's actually uh, different kinds of telehealth procedures. Uh, so just to go over it very sh shortly, for, for, health, uh, for physicians, you know, they could do a telehealth visit where they could actually start a new patient. That's been vague. Earlier it was that to do a telehealth visit, you have to have an established relationship to begin with. But Medicare kind of waived that requirement, not in exact words, but they're saying that they would not audit that in-person visit or the established relationship before, which means a new patient could go to, so a patient could go to a new provider and get their initial telehealth visit. They don't have to actually go to the patient's, uh, to the provider's office. But there's also virtual check-ins, which is basically a phone call. 
and there's still certain limitations to it, like how often or when it can be done or what's, what's reimbursable under Medicare and Medicaid and many insurances that follow the same guidelines. And then there are e-visits where you go to uh, uh, a web portal. So to answer that question, I mean, the choices would be to talk it over with the physician. If, because the, in this scenario, it seems the relationship has already been established and say, would, are you open to doing virtual check-ins where you're calling me or doing e-visits? Do you have a portal that I could use so that I can, you know, uh, do an e-visit with you? Uh, Short of that, the only answer I would have is you, you don't have to have an established relationship with another provider. You could keep this position. If you think, given the circumstances we are in, you could benefit with another provider, probably you want to establish that relationship with another provider who is now offering uh, telehealth. And in fact, Toledo does have, uh, I know of a, uh, couple of uh, telehealth physicians, uh, I mean, physicians that are offering telehealth services at this moment. That's great. Well, listen, I want to, we're, we're right over time here and I just want to thank you for your, uh, for your time with us being a part of our webinar series. This is, uh, this is great. It was informative. It was relevant. Uh, it was exactly what we were looking for. And I'm, I just really, I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that we had another chance to interact with you as, as the Ability Center and and in your work in healthcare. Um, so thank you so much for being a part of it. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And to everyone else watching, thanks for participating. Uh, this will be available on our website um, for anyone to share and come back to if you want to reference it. We'll make the slides available as well. And uh, next week we'll be with uh, Al Condolucci, uh, which will be a really, really fun, incredible conversation. So make sure to, to come back then. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.